Right, well, good evening, people. And if you join me in welcoming Professor Joseph Conlon, who, um, as you can see, teaches out of the other place. Um, hailing from Reading and completing a Natural Sciences BSc with PhD at Christ College, he then moved on to study string phenomenology, believe it is, with a slew of research papers at New College, Oxford. And I hope you're looking forward to his talk as much as me. Take it away. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, can you hear me at the back? Okay, so let me start by saying thank you very much for turning up. Um, it's uh, Wednesday evening, it's 8 o'clock, it must be getting late on in term. You know, it's dark, so thank you very much for coming to listen to me. So, I guess almost 15 years ago, I was myself on the member, a member of the CUPS committee, and never then did I think that I would re reach the exalted position of then of coming to give an actual talk to the CUPS. Okay, so as said, I'm at Oxford. Um, you may forgive me that because I was also here for nine years in total. Um, I have to say, after nine years here, you really need to leave, but I was actually here for nine years. And so now I'm at Oxford, and what I'm going to do is give you a talk today, uh, Making Light from the Dark Universe. So what this is a talk about, this is a talk about something sitting roughly between, you know, cos somewhere at the intersection between cosmology, particle physics, astrophysics, and string theory. And in particular, it's about something called dark radiation, which I will explain what that is. And let me also say that talks are generally more fun when they are interactive. So this is then an encouragement that if you want to stop me and interrupt me and ask questions as I go along, please do so. OK, so how's the talk going to be structured? So I first of all want to say what is actually meant by dark radiation. Um, probably all of you have probably heard of dark matter. So I want to say what is dark radiation. I want to describe what are the reasons for thinking it might, put, it might exist. We don't know whether it exists. It might exist. So I want to describe what possible reasons there are to think of this experimentally and theoretically, to think that this is something that might exist in the universe. It might be something that is worth thinking about how you would discover it. And then I want to get on to um, some work I'm thinking about, about how you would actually then look for this and a possible, and using these ideas as a possible explanation for a long-standing excess in soft X-rays from the spectra of galaxy clusters. OK, so let's start with some pretty pictures about the universe. OK, so... First of all, the visible universe. So these are kind of, you know, fabulously profound um, images of the universe that, you know, should always kind of make you go, wow, aghast. They're, pro they're probably not the first time you've seen them. They might be the first time you've seen them. So, so this is the Hubble Deep Field. So this is, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope basically pointed at a single spot of empty sky for something like two weeks, three weeks, a long period of time. And what you see in it is that the seemingly empty sky is entirely filled with galaxies. What appears to be nothing there is, in fact, very rich. This is the analogue for the X-ray universe. So this is exactly the same. So the Hubble Space Telescope is an optical telescope looking at visible light. The Chandra X-ray telescope, as the name suggests, is an X-ray telescope. So this is what's called, this is a Chandra deep field. So this is pointed at the same region of space as the Hubble deep field. And again, you see that it's filled with stuff. However, even though the universe looks rather dense, rather filled with all kinds of interesting stuff, and then again, if you look in microwaves, again, you now have a Planck satellite, which has had its latest data release only really in the last few weeks. However, one thing we know is that however much the universe looks like it's filled with stuff, 95% of the energy density of the universe we really do not have a good, a good handle on. And um, this is one reason why you know, physics and cosmology are such wonderful subjects to be studying from, because when 95% of your subject matter you're pretty ignorant of, it means there's quite a lot of work still to be done. So what do, what do we know about how the universe is made up of? 
So we know it's approximately 70% in dark energy. Um, this is this kind of mysterious stuff that looks, feels like it looks, behaves like it's a vacuum energy, an energy associated with the vacuum of space, filling all of space, but at approximately, you know, 10 to the 60, 10 to the 120, 10 to the 90, what have you, smaller than any natural theoretical estimate of what that vacuum energy should be. Approximately a quarter of the energy density of the universe is in the form of dark matter. So dark matter, what, do it mean, what does it mean to be matter here? Well, what matter means here specifically is to be not relativistic. So this looks like it's dark, we can't see it, doesn't interact with photons, doesn't give up photons, shows no sign of electromagnetic interactions, and it's matter, it's heavy, non-relativistic stuff. Approximately 5% of the energy density of the universe is in the form of baryons, where baryons are short for basically protons, neutrons, electrons, all the familiar and well-loved material of the standard model. There's 0.1% in the form of neutrinos, and there's approximately 0.001% in the form of the cosmic microwaves background, which is that you know, the, pervasive, the pervasive kind of glow throughout the universe at a temperature of 3 Kelvin of microwaves, which was um, which Penzias and Wilson you know, discovered in 1967 in what was you know, one of the most important results in cosmology, having first misidentified it as bird shit. Okay, so we know that most of the universe is dark. There's no known electromagnetic interactions. So we can't see it. So the, the way we infer its evidence is by weighing it. You know, it's the same way that if you had a, a bag full of you know, rocks, no way to look, you can't look inside, how much is it? Well, you have to weigh it. So the way we, you know, the, the existence of dark matter is inferred is, for example, looking at the rotation curves of stars going around the centre of the centre of galaxies. By looking at the speed of how they rotate, you can work out ordinary, you know, Newtonian mechanics how much mass there has to be. You can look at the visible mass, you count it up, you realise there's a deficit. There has to be something else. That something else is dark matter. Another way is through gravitational, gravitational lensing. You know that stuff that is massive bends light. So by looking at how light is bent and by how much light is bent, you can tell how much matter there is there. And this is a famous, this is the bullet cluster. So this is probably the most d direct measure of uh, the existence of dark matter there is. So what you see here, so this is two clusters of galaxies, two clusters of a hundred or a thousand galaxies that have collided. And what you see in red, so as we'll talk about later, clusters of galaxies, they have a temperature which is in the KEV regime. This means they emit thermal x-rays. They're just sending out thermal x-rays everywhere. And what you see in red is basically the, the x-rays. What, what you see in blue is the you see, the, in blue here is where the mass is. So what's happened is that you've collided this group of basically galaxies, gas and dark matter. They've collided it together. The gas, you can see the characteristic shock front here. So the gas is all interacted. So the galaxies are basically collisionless, so they've just gone straight through each other. And the mass, so the overall mass, however, um, there's far more mass in the gas than there are in the galaxies, but you can see the overall mass has also gone through each other, and so this, there's some additional mass, some dark mass, some dark matter that looks like to be associated here. Okay, so dark matter is something we know is there, and what dark matter is, is stuff that is dark and stuff that is non-relativistic. Non Sorry. Yeah. What do you mean by non-relativistic matter? Um, so stuff that isn't moving at a speed close to the speed of light. So basically, you know, so for example, the CMB is you know, 
because it's made up of light, is, is streaming everywhere at the speed of light. So the, if you have like dark matter particles, they'll be moving with a speed of something like 300 kilometers a second, but they won't be moving anywhere near light speed. And one of the other interesting things is about dark matter is that we have no real idea what it is. Anyone who tells you they know what dark matter is is lying to you. So there are many candidates, you know, wimps, axions, alps, sterile neutrinos, godzillas, wimpsips, sorry, not godzillas, wimpsillas. Um, but yeah, there's many, there's, there's loads of there's loads of candidates, but you know, there are no there is no direct evidence for the nature of dark matter. There's lots of direct evidence that dark matter exists, but there is nothing that tells us let give any really decent clue for what dark matter actually is. Yeah, so there are theoretically, well, people say theoretically preferred candidates, but you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, it means lots of theorists work on them. So like, lots of people have worked on WIMPs. That doesn't mean WIMPs are true. Yeah. Really, we do, we do not know what dark matter is. So this is definitely dark matter is dark, non-relativistic stuff. Definitely part of the universe. Lots of experiments trying to work out what it is. We don't know what it is. This talk is not about dark matter. So, once you're happy with the idea that dark, non-relativistic stuff exists, it's not entirely unreasonable that in the universe there might also be dark, relativistic stuff. So this is stuff, it's dark, we can't see it, no immediate interactions with light, and it's dark radiation because it's relativistic. It's travelling at or close to the speed of light. So this talk, what this talk is about, is about the possible existence of dark radiation, which is possible new relativist, dark relativistic stuff, not present in the standard model, and which may or may not be part of the universe. And another way of you know, asking this is in the standard model, you've got all these particles, well, there might, for example, be new massless particles that are not present in the standard model. There might be like hidden copies of the photon, which don't interact with any of the matter that makes up us, but just still exist. Could be there, we just don't know. Okay, so let me start say I want to talk something about how if it's there, or how dark radiation can be either measured or constrained. So there's an observable which is sensitive to the existence or not of dark radiation. And this observable is called NF. And what NF stands for is the effective number of neutrino species. So the reason called this is neutrinos are very, very light. Neutrinos are not massless, but compared to any of the other particles in the standard model, with the exception of the photon, neutrinos are almost massless. And neutrinos are produced in the early universe in the hot Big Bang. It's just hot, thermal, plasma. It's thermal, you just produce everything. It's where you your thermal or an equilibrium. That's what it means to be thermal, so you produce neutrinos. So in the early universe, hot big bang, you've got neutrinos flying around. These neutrinos are all highly relativistic. As the universe cools, these neutrinos still exist. And so there's a relic neutrino background in the universe. In the same way that the cosmic microwave background is the relic photon background of the universe, there is also a relic neutrino background. And in the early universe, and for quite a long period in the early universe, these neutrinos were relativistic. And because neutrinos interact extremely weakly, neutrinos are to almost all purposes dark. So the reason probing for dark radiation is called the effective number of neutrino species is in the early universe these, this would behave very much like extra neutrinos. Because neutrinos are dark and neutrinos are relativistic. And if yeah, if you say you've just got the standard model and you've got nothing other than the standard model, then the value NF will take when you measure it is 3.046. So the 3 is because there are three species of neutrino in the standard model, and the 0.046 is for various technical details, although you don't need to worry about, but you can ask me 
probably afterwards, I think, for that quick one, um, if, you, if you want. Okay, so this is sort of the standard value of an f. What another way of thinking about an f is in the early universe, what's the total amount of energy density in the early universe during the hot Big Bang? Yeah, what fraction of that is in photons? If you've got additional dark radiation, additional stuff which is there, dark and relativistic, then, if you like, you can say there's less energy density in the early universe in the form of photons than um, if you don't. And how, what fraction of energy is in the form of photons then feeds into all kinds of observables about the early universe. Okay, so now let me talk about um, experimental status of looking for NF. Okay, so there are two pieces of physics that are sensitive to additional radiation in the early universe. So the first is the cosmic microwave action. So the more you learn about cosmology, the more you will realise is that the cosmic microwave background, you know, this relic radiation from when the universe was around 380,000 years old, is an, is an exquisitely sensitive probe of the properties of the Earth universe. It's exquisitely sensitive because... This sounds kind of corny, but it's not. It's because it's all linear physics. So, yeah, one of the great things you learn in undergraduate physics is that when everything is linear, everything is easy. You know, when, it's when you have equations become nonlinear, uh, then you get everything becomes much more complicated to solve. But as long as you can just solve linear equations, everything is much easier and much more under control. And the beauty of the cosmic microwave background is that the physics which leads right leads to gives rise to it, gives rise to its structure, is all linear physics. So by looking at the very detailed properties of the microwave background, you, you can learn an awful lot about the early universe. The other aspect of the early universe that's very sensitive to the presence of additional radiation is the abundances of nuclear elements that are formed at Big Bang and nucleosynthesis. So the early universe was hot, this means that in the early universe, in the early universe, nuclei were formed thermally. Nuclei were formed thermally as just, for example, you know, protons. The protons and neutrons could just come together to form nuclei. And these, the expected abundances can be measured. So this is like right in the early universe when the universe was young. How much hydrogen was there? How much? Deuterium, how much helium, how much lithium. So these are definite predictions about the early unit, the properties of the early universe, and these can still be measured today. And the way people measure these, the primordial abundances, is they go and look at stars with low metallicity. So low metallicity is astrophysical slang for um, no real subsequent contamination through being you know, supernova explosions or anything else. So ideally, basically, stars which form very early on in the universe and have just stayed as they are since. And so by measuring the amount of, for example, you know, helium and deuterium and so on in such stars, you can get a measure of, in the early universe, what were the relative abundances of the nuclear elements, and thereby you get a measure of what the conditions were in the early universe at a time of around one second. Okay, so, yeah, so this is basically, this is the way you can probe, observationally, for the existence of additional dark radiation in the very early universe. Okay, so, um, I have to be honest and say that this is, this area, um, probably, the level of excitement has probably been de decreasing in time. So, because, okay, so... Something like a, a year and a half, two years ago, um, the, the various measurements of these quantities were kind of tending to hint at an excess of NF compared to the standard model value. So they were tending to come in 
systematically higher than 3. There was also a, there was also a discrepancy, well there still is to some degree, a discrepancy between the amount of value of the Hubble constant that you can predict, use it from the cosmic microwave background, so the, the Hubble constant, the rate at which distant galaxies are receding from us, to the value that is actually measured, and this discrepancy, which was sitting at a sort of two, two and a half sigma level, was one that you could get rid of in the presence of additional dark radiation. And also the measurements of the primordial abundances, such as, for example, helium and deuterium, were leading, so for example, there's this paper from around six months ago, so all these funny numbers, um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the, the archive or not, um, arxiv.org, so this is where basically every paper written on you know, cosmology, particle physics, you know, theoretical high energy physics, theoretical dense matter physics, and lots of other stuff is all available, and it's all getting put up. So, yeah, there's this paper, which recently this paper six months ago, looking at some pr primordial abundances in low metallicity stars, and again, finding a value of this that was high by uh, quite a high confidence. Okay, however, um, fortunately, these tensions have mostly been quite significantly reduced with, so there's a recent data recent from the Planck satellite, which occurred essentially in the last, in the last month, and so the tensions that are there, which are suggesting, suggesting non-zero dark radiation, have now actually have been significantly reduced. Um, you know, there's still there's still room for dark radiation up until up until to a amount which corresponds to sort of a delta f as a half or half the energy density that is in uh, one species of neutrino, but the positive hints have declined. However, this is still quite an exciting area because. Future experiments on the CMB, so these are future experiments that are either built or funded and are going to be built, by, you know, they are going to happen and they're going to produce data over the next decade, are going to probe the val this value of delta on F down to about 0 0.02. So basically the error bar on this quantity is going to shrink by a factor of 10 over the next decade. And so if there is some non-zero amount of dark radiation, then it may well appear over the next decade as the cosmological measurements get more precise. Okay, so the summary of the experimental situation. Okay, so um, something like a year to two years ago, everything was, you know, there was, things were pretty exciting. There were various determinations coming in high. It wasn't decisive, but they were definitely quite interesting. Um, there's separate hint, there were separate hints from the BBN and the CMB. Yeah, certainly all the CMB hints have really pretty much gone away with the recent Planck data release of last month. Although, I mean, there's still room for non-zero delta and F, but there isn't really any thing to be hinting at at the moment. The experimental sensitivity is going to get a lot better over the next decade, which will be able to tell us, you know, give much more information as to where the dark radiation might be present or not, and if it is present, how much of it there might be. Okay, so that's the summary of the experimental situation. So the next part I'm going to talk about theory, theoretical reasons to think why dark radiation should be there. Um, let me push pause for a moment to ask any, for any questions. Okay, let me unpause again. Right, let's talk about theory. Okay, so this is the, this is the one slide summary of the standard cosmology. So this is the one side slide, basically, summary of the history of the universe from 14 billion years ago to today. So on this history, the universe, very early in the universe there was inflation. The universe got very, 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 very big, very, 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 very quickly. At the end of inflation, and let me sort of, I don't have to really, I won't really describe precisely what's happening, but at the end of inflation, what happened is you, the part of the universe was filled with all these particles called inflatons, which if you know, which was sort of the particle that was drove inflation, but that, that might sound a bit vague, so don't worry about that. Okay, so then you go to this point where the universe is filled with these particles called inflatons, and then they decay. So they decay to other particles in the same way that, for example, the Higgs boson decays to two bottom quarks, or Higgs boson decays to two photons, 
or the pion decays to two photons, or any particle decays to any other particle. It decays, and it decays to particles of the standard model. So the interleukin decays to gluons, it decays to quarks, it decays to leptons, it decays to, to W bosons, to Z bosons, it decays to all the particles of the half standard model. The universe at this point is filled with particles of the standard model, it's extremely dense. This means this these will bang into each other. These cause the universe to be extremely hot. The universe at this point is like a very, very small, very, very hot oven. The universe expands, it gets bigger, it cools down, and 14 million years later, the relic of this very hot oven is this, which is the microwave map of the sky, is the cosmic microwave background everywhere, which is basically the legacy of this the black body legacy of this oven after it's just been left to cool down. Okay, so how can you get dark radiation? Okay, so we still have this picture where the universe inflates, it's very, very big, very, very quickly. And then we still have this picture where you go through this period where the universe is filled with these particles called inflatons. And the inflaton particles still decay, and they still have lots of joyous decay modes to the particles of the standard model, which then will again subsequently make the universe very hot, and the universe then cools down. However, suppose the inflaton also has additional decay modes. Suppose there also exist in the universe new massless particles, Particles that we have not, not discovered yet. And suppose the inflaton is able to decay to those. So the inflaton decays. These particles are very, very weakly interacting. So weakly interacting that they just fly through, fly through everything and don't interact. In the same way that a neutrino can fly through kilometers of solid lead without interacting. These particles just don't interact with anything else, so they just carry on to the present day, and they carry on to the present day, and they're relativistic to the present day, and they remain, remain to the present day as a dark relativistic background to the universe. Okay, so theoretically, you could get dark radiation whenever reheating involves decays to a, a mass to the hidden sector, as well as decays to particles of the standard model. And these massless hidden sectors, basically new massless particles, um, theorists are very easy at dreaming up new such massless particles, or almost massless particles, so examples of those, um, the QCD axiom, or the axiom of the quantum thermodynamics, axiom like particles, hidden photons, WISPs, which stands for weakly interacting slim particles, new chiral fermions. Yeah, they're easy to, they're easy to dream up. Many theories have them. Many extensions of the standard model have such particles. Okay, so in this talk I'm going to focus on one particular type of new particle, and that particular type of particle are axions, or more technically kind of axion-like particles. Now, axion like particles, no, so why focus on these? Okay, so one reason. Um, if you had to pick one particle beyond the standard model, where um, I would, which has not been discovered yet, which I would be willing to bet significant amounts of money does actually exist, that particle would be the axion. And the reason for this is that there is a problem in the standard model. There is um, a problem in the standard model of particle physics, which is kind of clear, obvious, and it has one very clean, beautiful solution, with the axiom, which seems like it almost certainly must be correct. And this is called the, so let me, I'm going to describe this problem a little bit to you. This problem is called the strong CP problem, but Maybe that, that's jargon, let's not worry about that. 
Um, let's put it this way. So it's the problem of why the neutron does not have an electric dipole moment. Okay. So you know that you expand you know, charge distributions, you can expand in multipoles. The monopole is the electric charge, then you can have dipoles, quadrupoles, and so on. So the neutron has no monopole. The neutron is neutron. However, the neutron, you would think, well, even though it's neutral, it's made up of you know, quarks, the quarks are moving about, it, there should be some overall dipole moment to the neutron. And people have tried to measure this. And they have consistently found the answer zero. And so far, I mean, the level of this consistency is that if you take your kind of basically naive natural estimates for what the neutral, the electrical dipole of the neutron should be, you are, zip, you are around, the experimental limits are around 10 billion times smaller than what the natural value should be. So there's a natural value you would estimate based on saying, you know, the neutron's made up of quarks, this is the, the size of the neutron is about 10 to the minus 15 metres. So, you know, you say, <coughs> <coughs> the neutron is up, down, down, so you've got an up quark here, a down quark here, a down quark here. They are separated by 10 to the minus 15 metres, so you multiply by the electric charge to get a dipole moment. Yeah, and so this is your naive estimate, and we know the answer is it's at least a factor of 10 to the 10 smaller. And the reason for this is that, or what's it, yeah, this is equivalent to a statement. Um, that again, in the standard model, so I've got the Lagrange in here, but let's, well, probably, probably most of you don't really know what that, mean, what that equation means, so let's not worry about it, but let's put it this way. In the equation of the standard model, there is an angle. There is an angle which is called the theta angle. This angle can go anywhere between 0 and 2 pi. And this angle is equivalent to what the, this electric dipole moment for the neutron is. So the value for this angle determines the electric dipole moment of the neutron. And the fact that the, the fact that the measured dipole moment is zero is equivalent to the statement that the angle is smaller than around 10 to the minus 10. And the reason the axion is as a particle is so attractive, so I would just state that if the axion exists, it just completely solves this problem and it just dynamically forces this angle to be so small. If it fact, dynamically forces the angle to be zero and therefore solves this problem. Axioms are also attractive because if you care about it, you know, if you think about things like string theory or things you might think are going to be alt, sort of kind of quantum gravity style theories of physics, axioms kind of just come out, pop out extremely generically within string theory. So this is one where no, I personally kind of got into thinking about axioms. I started off in string theory, and then I sort of string theory applications to axioms, and then I moved a bit to this more phenomenological area. Uh, sorry, yeah. did you mention what axioms actually are? So they're a type of particle. So um, they've got, so they're kind of like a parity odd scalar, if that, depending on how. But they're, let me put it this way. I mean, they're, they're, it's here's probably enough to say they are a specific type of particle. So like the, the Higgs is like a type of particle. The electrons are a type of particle. So an axion is a particular type of particle. Um, yeah. Depending on how technical <coughs> one can get, one could say it's like a pseudo scalar or a parity odd scalar, but that might not mean very much. So here I'm just going to leave it as saying that they are a particular special type of, type of particle. So what's topological about the term exactly? So what's topological about this term is essentially that if you inter if, you <coughs> if you take configurations of the field that are anyway continuously related to the zero configuration, this integral vanishes. So if you choose any kind of configuration, so this term you can actually write as um, e dot b. So for electromagnetism, you can write this as the electric field dot the magnetic field. And then it's a statement that basically, if you have any field configuration over space-time that is continuously deformable to zero, this integral vanishes completely. So this integral is only ever non-zero for electric and magnetic field configurations or generalizations thereof that are topologically non-trivial. Okay, so now I want to 
start talking about axions as dark radiation. Okay, so where I got you was saying that if you have periods of the universe dominated by inflatons, inflaton, these inflatons can decay, they can decay, they decay to axions, then what these axions can lead to are dark radiation because they don't interact with anything and they just propagate freely through the universe and they are also dark, so they're dark, they're relativistic, that makes them dark radiation. Okay, so just to recap on this physics, so yeah, if you have heavy particles and they decay to visible sector particles, like the particles of the standard model, if you have an energetic kind of standard model particle, what happens is it just turns it into hundreds or thousands of other standard model particles. So you might well have seen, for example, these pictures of like collisions at the Large Hadron Collider, and what you will see is these kind of jets of particles which are just streaming through the detector, where you've got basically you know, hundreds or thousands of tracks that are coming through the detector. And this is because if you produce a highly energetic particle of the standard model, it has precisely this tendency to turn, to split from being one into like hundreds and thousands of highly energetic particles. And what happens is that then you just basically produce this whole sea, thermal sea bath of particles. Whereas if you produce particles that are extremely weakly interacting, they just free stream and don't interact with anything. So this is in the same way at something like the, the LHC. If, you look, if they produce neutrinos at the LHC, the neutrino just goes straight through the detector, straight out, and does not interact with anything at all. Okay, so why? So where does this lead us? So here, um, the calculations that kind of lead here aren't very long, but then in but in a talk. It's always very hard to kind of follow these things in real time. So let me just state this briefly. Okay, so if you have like a two-body decay, so okay, so this this line just the last I'm going to ask you just to accept as a so MP here is Planck mass 10 to the 18 jet. So this line I'm just going to ask you to accept and then just to really state what the key result is. So if you have a two-body decay, um, one molar particle to decay into two daughter particles, then the energy of the daughters is basically half the mass of the mother. And the key kind of point, which is um, partly also on this previous slide, so the key sort of physics point here, is that if you go to, if you decay to something which then also subsequently to, kind of distributes its energy over hundreds or thousands or millions of other particles, the energy of each one particle is much, much lower than the original energy. Whereas if you go to, a part, if you go to something which just then doesn't interact, the energy of each one of these particles is far greater than the energy of any one individual particle here, because while the initial energy was the same in both cases, this one hasn't had to basically dissipate it, this one it dissipates it over, over many projects. Okay, so, so where this is leading to is then the statement which I'll just ask you to accept, that if this happens, then the energy of each individual of these dark radiation particles is much greater than the energy of each individual photon of the cosmic microwave background by a very large fra fraction. And it's a fraction that I will ask you to accept that for reasonable parameter values is around a million. And this is a, race, a ratio that is retained throughout the cosmic history of the universe. Okay, so this... So this part, you know, this is not an absolute prediction. Um, it involves not many, but some, a couple of kind of reasonable theoretical assumptions. But I'm going to now focus on how, if this was the case, um, what it might possibly explain, and then how you would test it. Okay, so this, the idea would be that then the, these axions that we pushed by more in the very early universe, today their characteristic energy would be around a million times that of a photon of the cosmic microwave background. Skip. Okay, so the cosmic microwave background is a microwave background, which means that the, the energy of each individual photon in the microwave background is around milli 
electron volts, around a thousandth of an electron volt. So if you have something which is a million times more energetic than that, then the characteristic energy is that of kilo electron volts. So where this would lead to then is the suggestion, the idea that you could have a, a dark background, a background of dark radiation, so radiation that is dark, a bit like dark matter, except it's relativistic. So e each particle of which has a characteristic energy of somewhere around um, X-ray energies, KV kind of energies. These are everywhere in the universe. So, you know, even if um, the, so, yeah, and if they were there, they would be there in reasonably decent numbers. So what do I mean by this? Is that even if the, even if the overall magnitude of this dark energy, this dark radiation energy, was you know, unobservably, unobservably small. I mean, the level of like one hundredth of that of the typical, of yeah, delta and f was like one hundredth. So you have about one hundredth of the energy density in a single neutrino species, then it's still the case that, it would still be the case that if you just put your hand out, you would have something like one million of these passing through your hand every single second. And this would be everywhere, um, and it would be kind of a dark relic of the very early universe. Okay, and so the current energies today would be of energies of around a few hundred electron volts. And so then the question would be, if this existed, um, how would you see it? Okay, so before I go on to the last and final part of this talk, are there any more questions? Um, do we have any other predictions for the properties of axions? So, um... So yes, okay, so there's a difference in whether axions, okay, there's a, a difference I don't really want to go into whether axions are kind of basically what's called the QCD axions or more generally axion-like particles. So axions, yeah, but one thing sorry, is that axions can be produced in the sun. So and this actually I've been talking <coughs> a little bit about um, that they're streaming out from the sun and you can try and look for them by basically pointing telescopes at the sun. So this is, so let, so let me defer that question really to is an inflaton an axion? It could be. Um, we don't know what the inflaton is. It could be. It's probably not, but it could be. Okay, so suppose we had such a background of relativist axions. How would we see it? Okay, so one of the key features of axions, so here, this is, um, I said, but you probably you might well not remember, there's this topological term you can rewrite as E dot B. So if, you're, um, if you've got some familiarity with reading kind of field theory Lagrangians, then what this term is is a coupling of the axion field A to E dot B of electromagnetism. And this is said that the coupling is a weak coupling, so it's suppressed by some very high scale. If you haven't got any familiarity with reading field theory Lagrangians, then let me basically say that what this term tells you is that what axions do is they interact with the electromagnetic field. And the particular interesting feature of axions is that if you put a background magnetic field on, if axions are moving through a background magnetic field, they convert into photons. So they kind of quantum mechanically oscillate into photons, and this is a precisely an analogous piece of physics to the way that different species of neutrino oscillate between each other. Okay, so the message that if you've got a magnetic field and you've got axions, axions that can convert into photons. Sorry, is it possible to turn photons back to axions? Yes, okay. yeah. It's like neutrino oscillations, they just oscillate back, back and forth. Um, if, if they can interact electromagnetically, how would you call them dark? Okay, so normally what you mean when we say interact electromagnetically, um, normally that means kind of we mean interact via the ele electromagnetic force. So this isn't an interaction via the ele electromagnetic force. It's a sort of one of these really, really suppressed interactions. So let me try to give an analogy of what I mean. Okay, so electromagnetism... Um, yeah, involves energy. If you've got photons, that's energy. 
energy gravitates, so light, light gravitates. Now, so there's a coupling between light and <coughs> gravity. That doesn't mean that you know, gravity interacts electromagnetically. It just means there's a very weak coupling between gravity and light. And this is, this is sort of analogous to that. OK, so there's this cool experiment to CERN. Um, um, this is probably not an experiment you've heard of, but conceptually it's very nice. Which is it's called the CAST experiment, which is the CERN Axiom Solar Telescope. So this you may recognise as this is an LHC dipole magnets. This is one of the spare test magnets from the LHC. And basically what they do is they point the magnet at the sun, and they've got it on tracks, and it's in a closed building, so there's a you know, good solid roof to prevent any photons getting through. And they track the magnet across the sky, where, where, where the sun would be. And what they're looking for are axioms that are produced by the sun, say out here, are coming through the building, head into the magnet, they turn the magnet on so that you've got a big, you know, a large magnetic field in. The axioms that would then convert to photons um, inside the magnet, and then you'd have a detector here that would then see these as X-ray photons. So this is a characteristic way of looking for axions, and this experiment has been used to place bounds on the interactions of axions of matter, and you know, there are similar, and so this is this is the type, this is a type, a typical type of axion experiment. Yeah, and these things are being upgraded and they try and do better and better to get further and further with the hope of one day discover, actually discovering the axiom. Okay, so the basic point is that axions convert to photons in transverse magnetic fields. Um, let's skip that and just so give you the conversion probability. So for kind of typical astrophysical parameters, So the thing about going to astrophysical environments is you have the very big, and so you've got very big coherence lengths to the magnetic field. And so let me just give you some numbers. So if you've got a magnetic field which is size one micro gauss, so um, a gauss is 10 to the minus 4 tesla, so a micro gauss is 10 to the minus 10 tesla. If you have a magnetic field of 10 to the minus 10 tesla, coherent over a kiloparsec, and You've got a, an axion photon coupling around, which is set by a scale of 10 to the 13 Jev. Then you get conversion rates of an axion to photon of roughly you know, 1 in 100. So an axion passing through 1 kiloparsec of space would have a roughly 1 in 100 million chance of converting to a photon. Now, that doesn't sound very big, but if you work this out as a conversion rate per unit time, acting as a form of energy, you're converting energy to light, what you actually, you actually realise that this conversion rate is something like, in terms of a per time conversion rate of energy to light is about a thousand times more efficient than the sun at converting energy to light. So it's not that bad. Okay, so suppose we've got a background of axioms. Where do you look? Okay, so I'm just going to tell you that the best place to look are galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters are these large clusters of galaxies. Um, they've got around 100 to 1,000 galaxies bound together under gravity. Clusters are filled with this kind of hot gas with KV X-ray temperatures. And you, know, you can see them in the sky. They're not that common, but they're not that infrequent either. They're basically the biggest, the biggest bound objects in the universe. So clusters, galaxy clusters, are the larger scales you'll find in the sky, which are actually gravitation, which are kind of you know, gravitation, are gravitationally bound and have, and have virilized. So they're basically stuff has fallen in and it's come to equilibrium. So here I'm going to focus on the Coma cluster, which is a large one of these kind of prototype of clusters. It's relatively nearby, only 300 million light years, and it's at what's called high galactic latitude. Um, which basically means yeah, the galaxy is a disk. So if you look in the plane of the galaxy, um, you've got all kinds of kind of dust and mess and rubbish to try and look through. So if you look straight up out of the galaxy, there's less rubbish in the way. And so you can see more clearly. And so high galactic latitude is precisely that, that you're looking straight up out of the galaxy rather than trying to look through the plane of the galaxy. 
Okay, so here's some pictures of coma. This is coma in observed in radio. Um, that's in that, there it is there. Here's coma in the visible. So every dot here is a galaxy. Here's coma in x-rays. So this is the characteristic behaviour of clusters in x-rays, that you've got this basically diffuse hot gas that permeates the cluster, and you see this diffuse x-ray glow. OK, so what should I say? Um, yeah, let me just say okay, that coming through, so x-rays, if you've got axions with x-ray energies coming through the cluster, they've got a decent chance of converting to a photon. And if they convert to a photon, you can see the photon. Okay, so you do the numbers and you find that these things are actually pretty luminous. So the values of the coupling of the axion to photons that are basically excluded by, or no, so basically just on the boundary or not excluded by direct search experiments, you would basically outshine the entire cluster, which is obviously far too luminous. But what's interesting is that I've said yeah, this dark radiation background of axions could have energies of a few hundred electron volts. What's interesting is there's a long-standing excess in these soft X-ray energies from galaxy clusters. And this has been around for sort of 15 or 20 years for reasons I will not bore you with. The old satellites are actually far better at the newer satellites at looking at this. And so what um, well, is an interesting possibility. Um, you know, probably it is not correct, almost all proposals for new physics fail, is that possibly that this excess could arise from a conversion of a background of cosmic relic axions into photons within the magnetic fields of the cluster. Okay, so things of the excess, I'm going to skip that and just basically, because I'm running out of time, just come to basically the proposal. So the proposal is that this excess X-rays of X-rays from galaxy clusters could be generated by axion to photon conversion in the, the magnetic field of the cluster. And um, let me show you some pretty pictures of what the conversion would look like. Probabilities are so red is more and blue is less. These are pretty of what the conversion would look like going through the simulated magnetic field of the coma cluster. Sorry, what's EA? The energy of the axion. Oh. So basically depending as it as the energy is increased from low energies to high energies. Okay, so let me just wrap up as I think I'm out of time and let me just summarise the whole talk. Okay, so dark radiation is something interesting. It's relativistic dark stuff. Dark matter is non relativistic Dark radiation, we don't know it's there. It's an extension of the standard cosmology. It may or may not be there. It's well motivated theoretically. Um, the experimental motivation, um, well, okay, so it probably, it's fair to say, it was, it was good. Um, it's, now, it's now marginal, but there is the experimental ability to measure this stuff is going to get improved by a factor of 10 over the next decade. So if it's there, it might well be discovered. Natural, well motivated theoretical models lead to this expectation for a, kind of a basic, a, a dark relativistic background of cosmic axions that would parallel the visible relic background of microwave photons. And I finish with the sort of speculative suggestion that such this, such an axion background may be observed by axion to photon conversion in the magnetic fields of galaxy clusters and may already be visible through this long-standing excess, astrophysical excess, in the extreme ultraviolet and soft X-rays from galaxy clusters. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I've got one. So um, are there any other direct ways of uh, detecting axions other than the conversion? So, okay, so one possibility, there's another possibility which um, is that axions can also, in a slightly subtle way, also be dark matter. So axions are a dark matter, uh, can be a dark matter candidate. Then they're produced in a totally different way to the way I've described here. But axion, there's another way of producing axions which can lead to them being a dark matter candidate. And then, again, what, there's a do, what you do is you try and convert these axions into photons and using... Uh, um, 
things like you know, using basically similar kind of physics to lasers. So you aim at, but you, 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 you try and do kind of resonant enhancement of axion photon conversion in, in magnetic fields. And this is look, this, this is another way of looking for axions. This is looking for axion dark matter. Other ways are there's these sort of light shining through walls experiments. So basically, you get some super energetic laser, throw it at a concrete wall. Behind the concrete wall, you put a great, a great big strong, strong magnet. So the idea is you photon, um, sorry, 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 first of all, photon through large magnetic field, hopefully to convert some to axions. Big concrete wall, hopefully axions will go through. Big magnetic field, other side, I try and reconvert the axions to photons. So these are light shining through walls experiments, and these are another way of looking for axions. How successful or unsuccessful? So, so far, all these things are producing basically up, up and down. So, basically, you know, the interaction, so the, the physics is parameterized heavily by the strength of the interaction between the axion and electromagnetism, and the weaker it is, the harder, the harder it is to find it directly. So, these experiments are basically continually improving the bounds. On, on that coupling. Whether this is something that will lead to a detection would basically depend on what that coupling is, and we just don't know that. All you can do is look. So which is a better method for detecting based on current bounds? It really depends on what you're looking for. So you know, the question of dark matter, you make a big assumption about the nature of dark matter, and then you go and, but you, so then you're totally reliant on that assumption. Something like looking for axions from the sun, or lights for shining through walls, you're making no assumption about the nature of dark matter, but you, you know, you've got other, you've got other limits. Yeah, you you've got other constraints. So there was a question. Yeah. Any more questions? What are the energy levels like in this kind of experiment? You mentioned about light shining through walls. Is it a very high energy kind of physics, or is it a low energy physics? It's nothing. So, it's not, so an attractive thing about axions is it's totally decoupled from something like collider physics. Oh. Okay. So, I mean, these they aren't quite benchtop experiments, but they're not much bigger than benchtop oh. experiments. So, so these are like optical lasers, or. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so this, so this is, you know, there's like various frontiers of particle physics. So the energy is the high energy frontier, mm -hmm. and this is kind of the low energy, weakly coupled fr frontier. Yeah. So I mean, this, is, this stuff has no technological limitation on basically the, bit, the ability to improve it. I mean, there's certainly no need to build mm -hmm. big colliders to kind of improve the bounds of this stuff. Um. So are there any like developing theoretical models on these like uh, like standard model and but beyond that? So you've got the standard model of cosmology, which is basically called lambda CDM, which is that you've got lambda is the cosmological constant, dark energy, and CDM is dark matter. And so then you've got these various extensions beyond this. So dark radiation is one of these extensions, and these are the sorts of things that, like for example, the Planck's Planck satellite team, many of whom are, are, are based in Cambridge. Um, so these are they're trying to basically test these extensions with the CMB data to see if there's any. So I was referring to like any particle theories, like if you have like developed an area in say string theory to investigate this kind of particles. To investigate axions. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so, so one thing that I've done quite a bit of is you know, so, so you look at string models and you say what type of axions arise, what are their typical properties. What is the typical strength of their of, of, of their coupling? Okay. But then, when you want to kind of you know test these models, you know it's sort of this the sort of technology that I've described here. Uh, that is relevant. So, do you think it would be a good test of a string theory then? <laughs> oh, 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 some test. Um, let's put it. Um, Okay, string theory is naturally a theory just to fight this under the quantum gravity scale. It's extremely hard to think of anything, any decisive up or down test <coughs> you do at currently accessible technology. String theory also, though, gives you lots of kind of ideas for you know, possible extensions of, for example, the standard model of particle physics. And these possible extensions are kind of perfectly well testable in the ordinary, perfectly standard way. So, for example, axioms are one of these. Things you can say, you've got an axiom with a particular coupling constant, you can just go and look at that in standard way. Now, you can't really turn party this into some grand overall test of is string theory a true theory of quantum gravity or not 
you using that it doesn't mean that having all these ideas for how to look for new physics isn't useful. Are there any more questions? Can we join? Uh, can we thank our speaker for coming down uh, all the way from Oxford? Um, if you want to talk to him, you can talk at the wine and cheese reception downstairs. <laughs>